I turn mine on because I'm going to talk a lot. All right, uh, go ahead and call this meeting to order. Um, it is 12 o'clock on May, uh, which day is the 17th of June. And uh, notice hereby given a regular meeting of the Animal Shelter Advisory Committee of the City of San Angelo to be held on June 17th, 2021 at 12 p.m. in City Hall, East Mezzanine at 72 West College, San Angelo, Texas, for the purpose of considering the following agenda items. Uh, let's see here, we'll call to order. We have a quorum. Uh, do we have anyone who wants to make public comment? No public comment. Then we'll move to the consent agenda. Uh, consider approving April 15th, 2021 Animal Shelter Advisory Committee regular meeting minutes. Do I have any questions or any changes? How about a motion? I'll make a motion. Caitlin made, made the motion. Second. Doctor seconded it. And uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Same sign. Did they pass? Um, number four is the regular agenda. The first thing is discussion of possible action related to the monthly shelter numbers for April 2021. Chegwin. Thank you. So we wanted to report on our monthly activity for April. Uh, we did have 413 new arrivals. Um, that's a little high for us, but it's due to the seasonality of kitten season that we saw a large increase there. I also think I reported last time about March that we were having a curious um, puppy season, a curiously early and um, large and hectic and um, parvo filled kitten season starting around March 11th. And so that continued through the month of April. So a lot of that intake was um, young animals, four months and younger. We uh, did have a, a Pets Alive site visit in April to help um, support our uh, practices related to Parvo and really br we broadened it to a lot of other things as well. Um, so we did get some good feedback and support. Uh, we did have 92 animals adopted, 109 transferred out, always a bonus when that's over 100. Uh, we had 152 animals redeemed by owner, uh, 30, 26 of those were wildlife, and the remainder were traditional uh, reclaimed by their owner. 25 were deceased, and I do have more information on that. So we finished the month uh, with a relatively low population in the shelter of 310 animals. Uh, the majority of that was dogs. We were still running real low on cats because of the large um, transports we had as a result of Winter Storm Uri that we were able to send quite a few of our cats um, out of state through our uh, partnerships with Concha Valley Paws and Pets Alive. So April was another stellar month with us, uh, having 93% of our animals released alive. This is the sixth month in a row, being over 90%. And just to shed some more light on those animals that we lost in April, um, 25 were either euthanized or died in custody, 13 were cats, six were dogs, and six were other. Uh, we did have uh, two deer and a variety of other wildlife that we euthanized for injury. Uh, we generally do refer deer to the game warden, uh, but there was a training where all the game wardens in the covering our area were out of town. And so they were in animals in need of immediate attention. And um, so that did fall to us to take action on. And then another way to break that down of the 25 animals um, that died in custody or were euthanized, 20 were sick, injured, or failure to thrive, and five were aggressive or because of a bite incident. And then one way to break down our performance uh, for the month of April, 21% of our outcomes were adoptions, 41% were returned to owner, 31% were transferred out, and 7% deceased, which gives us that 93% live release rate. And that's your April. Awesome. It's uh, great to see such a high live release rate. Mm -hmm. Also, lately. good to see the return to owner being, you know, 40%. So that's actually really nice to see that. Because, I mean, in all honesty, there's a lot of dogs and cats mm -hmm. end up at the shelter. And, you know, the more that actually do have a home to begin with, the better they are. So 
for sure. All right, does anybody have any questions about the numbers? All right, we'll move on to uh, discussion of possible action related to the monthly shelter numbers for May 2021. Uh, so May didn't fare as well. May is always really tough for us. Um, it's the uh, height of kitten season and the beginnings of parvo season. Our intake stayed high uh, with 410 new arrivals. Uh, we had 64 adoptions. A lot of that's related to, um, you know, end of school year and Memorial Day adoptions kind of slow down as folks are traveling and, and dealing with family issues. Uh, we also had 81 animals transferred out and 146 uh, redeemed by owner. 31 of those were wildlife. Um, so we did have more deaths in May uh, than prior, prior months at 42 animals either died in custody or euthanized. And we finished with our uh, population at the shelter much increased at almost 400 animals. We had about a 30% increase in the number of animals we were housing from April to May. And so those few months where we were not full and we had sent so many animals on transport are officially over and we are definitely at capacity um, at month end. Uh, so uh, May did have 87% of our animals released alive. Um, that is the first time we've dropped down below 90% in a while. Uh, we did plan for May to have um, some lower performance, uh, so I don't think we're at risk of failing our annual goal of 90%. Um, we actually, our goal for May, I think, was 87.5, and, and we were so close to that. So um, improved from last May, uh, not as good as prior months in this same year. And of those animals that we lost, 42 um, either euthanized or died in custody. 34 were cats. Um, we're still um, struggling with those neonatal um, cats, as well as um, feral cats attacked in the field. So if we have a cat that's wild and she suffered a dog bite or, or something like that, um, it is something that we're um, unable to treat and administer you know, any kind of care. And so those are cats that unfortunately um, have to simply be put out of their misery. Um, so that was included in May as well. Five dogs, and then you see other was vastly decreased down to just three, uh, two raccoons and one possum that were injured in the field. Uh, we do reach out to uh, wildlife rehabilitators, but just like us, they're very um, limited on resources and um, offer care when they can, but sometimes do have to say, you know, I'm not at a position to take on, you know, a, a raccoon to rehab at this time. And another way to break down our animals that we lost, 39 were sick, injured, and failure to thrive, and three were due to aggression. So that was your May performance. Do you have any, any, have any questions on the May numbers? No? All right. Um, <clears throat> update on city council discussion on chapter three. Animal Control, Article 3.10, Free Roaming Community Cats of the City's Code of Ordinances. Uh, we did have a request from Councilmember Gonzalez to discuss our Code of Ordinances related to community cats. And so we just had that meeting two days ago, and I anticipated getting some direction to report back to y'all. And I also just wanted y'all to have this same um, information that we presented. Um, our council presentation was a lot of discussion, um, but I do have uh, a presentation just to bring y'all up to speed. Uh, the short answer is city council approved a new program for us to launch and uh, to kind of deal with nuisance colonies or nuisance gatherings of cats um, that need to be um, uh, abated um, humanely, meaning not catch and kill, but trap, neuter, release. Um, so first, there was some discussion about that we're not um, providing appropriate cat intake or um, cat care, and so we did want to clarify that we offer um, cat intake to San Angelo residents only. That is something we considered earlier this year, back in March, to limit our intake to city limits only. Uh, those citizens may bring in cats at no charge or picked up for a fee. Um, if they've been caring for a cat uh, for three or more days, as defined in the ordinance, they may rehome through support services. 
uh, with our rescue partner, Contra Valley Paws, so they may participate in getting that pet spay neutered, uh, putting it up for adoption directly from its home um, to set that animal up for success, not actually coming into the shelter, but still offering those support services. Um, so that is all how we offer cat intake. Uh, we did have over 1,600 cats um, taken in in the fiscal year 2020, um, so we do believe that we are offering um, a lot of support for cats. Um, so we talked a little bit about the community cat ordinance. So the ordinance was adopted in 2015, which was really in the infancy of no kill. It was drafted largely uh, by a um, special interest group, a private group, and was considered by the council. Some of y'all were here when, when that was done. Um, and it, it lays out different requirements uh, for the different groups. So for example, it requires sponsoring organizations uh, to provide information to people who care for cats, trap cats, anything like that. Um, it also allows, if I notify them I have an ear-notched cat, um, they will reach out to the colony in that area, have them come claim that cat and put it where, back where it belongs. Uh, they also are required to coordinate the spay-neuter of those animals and calls and complaints, um, as well as a variety of other things that they may do, but these are the things they're required to do. Uh, colony caregivers, of course, are, are given the, the, the bulk of the work, um, and these are the things they're required to do. Again, lots of other optional recommended things in the ordinance, like um, vaccinating um, and microchipping, but they are required to spay, neuter, and rabies vaccinate. They are required to speed farther than 150 feet from schools and daycares and to get permission from private property owners if using um, that property and to seek medical attention when necessary. And for animal services, our requirements under the ordinance are really limited. Um, we are required to scan cats for microchip, uh, which of course we do, and we are required to refer citizens to sponsoring organizations. And that may be um, citizens calling to complain about a colony in their area, uh, citizens who are caring for a group of cats, or um, trapping, just really anybody that's interacting with these animals. Um, that proved problematic a couple years ago when the um, sponsoring organization actually issued a cease and desist for us to no longer provide their name and contact info. A couple of groups in town did provide that in 2019, and so that, that's something that we're knowingly not complying with in the ordinance, um, but um, there is room for improvement in the law and some changes, um, but that's just what we're living within right now. I have a question as far as um, cease and desist, uh, giving out what I assume would be public information to rescue group contacts. And as a you know veterinarian, I've never had this issue or someone issuing me a cease and desist letter for giving out information about you know uh, providing a potential helping service. So I don't know uh, how that law works, but um, is that actually an enforceable legal action against the city to not be able to provide that information to the public? Or um, is that just, um, or is that just trying to not stir any more hard feelings or ill goodwill? Um, I mean, uh, if the groups don't wish to be contacted, then I'm not going to be the one to force that issue. It's just more of a general question because I don't have knowledge or experience with that problem in my life, so that's all. And frankly, I didn't either. And so when I received the first one, I did provide it to our um, city attorney and asked for guidance on how to proceed. You know, was there anything further we needed to do? And she said, no, just simply comply and, and don't give out their name in uh, to citizens or, or people um, in any way. And so we, um, the way we deal with that just on a, in a daily interaction with a citizen is uh, we encourage them to reach out to rescues in their area. And if they ask for specific names or contact info, we encourage them just to simply do a, a web search um, as we are prohibited from providing that information. Certainly, you know, within our coalition and partnership, we do try to serve citizens um, the best that we can um, through the services and our contract with Contra Valley Paws and our services through the city. Um, but if, for example, if it's someone who um, 
uh, lives outside city limits or someone who has been caring for the pet but doesn't want to participate in rehoming services, um, that's simply how we handle it is um, to encourage them to do a web search for a rescues in their area um, so that we are compliant with that um, edict. Well, I mean, I guess that's something that we're, it's just kind of a, you know, unfortunate deal that uh, resources have to be given basically through a third, you know, extra step of a person that may or may not take it. So, um, just kind of disappointing across the board on that. So, but thank you for answering the question. Absolutely. So, can another organization be nominated as a sponsor organization? I mean, according to the ordinance, you've got to have one. If someone's got to nominate, or it's got to be nominated, and you've got to have a sponsoring organization. So if one chooses not to maybe participate, is there another organization that can take that on? Well, I think that there, there is a sponsoring organization, and they are doing a variety of the bulk of the things uh, required in the ordinance. Um, I'm just not able to comply with this one component of it, which is to refer to citizens refer to it. And, and I guess I still am simply by saying, you know, do a web search for, you know, community cat services in your area. Um, th I think there is an opportunity for them to be, there to be, you know, multiple sponsoring organizations. Um, but I think if other groups were to come to the table and ask, there would be a request to, um, you know, some folks, some groups may do some of these items. Uh, this was written by the special interest group that has requested to be the sponsoring organization. If other groups came to the table and said, I wanna support community cats, I wanna be a part of it, they may not do all of these things. And so they, it would be difficult for them to truly become a sponsoring organization because they're asked to comply with a law that they didn't write, that, that they didn't, um, they may provide, for example, three out of five, four services and, um, you know, what opportunity is there to change the law to be more open to other groups? Um, but as far as a, a lack of compliance, I, th I think they are doing a lot of things related to community cats. The ordinance also provides that uh, this group may set policy. Um, when I started in late 2017, uh, up to kind of mid-2018, uh, the practice was that if a community cat came in that wasn't ear notch, that cat was euthanized as unadoptable. And so that's something that, you know, we were uncomfortable with and we wanted to seek uh, resources for. And so in 2018, um, this group was able to consider and approve a shelter neuter return program. And so I was able to harvest about $20,000 in salary savings for the spay neuter of cats coming into the shelter. Um, and if they're candidates for um, return to field, we would uh, go ahead and do that. Um, so we did that through the end of 2018, all of 19, and a lot of 20, until those funds were completely expended. Um, that does um, provide for the most humane um, outcome for the cat in question. Um, cats serve a function in our ecosystem. We believe the community is well served by these cats being back uh, where they belong. And I did have some more information about the vacuum effect to go over with council. I think a lot of y'all are well versed in that, so I'll go through it quickly. Um, but but as you'll as you'll recall, we we did that program for for quite a while. Almost a thousand cats run through that program. Um, a lot of successes there, uh, but by late 2020, uh, funds were fully expended. Uh, we had to unfortunately halt the program. Um, salary savings were frozen um, by city council due to coronavirus, and no additional funding uh, was approved through the budget cycle, which I did request and communicate, but it, it was a difficult financial time for the community, which I completely understand, of course. Um, so it was short-lived um, that we were returning to field cats that were unaltered um, less than three months uh, when Concho Valley Paws was able to deploy resources to pull all of our community cats, which is our current practice now. So we take in um, community cats, identify them as candidates for return to field. Um, Concho Valley Paws incurs the expense of um, spay-neuter and the rabies vaccine, and then those cats are put back where they belong. 
And just really briefly um, to speak to the vacuum effect and why that is just really the best situation for the community is that if you just take cats out and, and remove them, um, new cats from outside move in, fill that empty territory, um, cats continue to breed and, and reproduce, and we've proven again and again that decades of catch and kill uh, does not work. Um, that uh, I ran a quick report in, in in PetPoint, um, we've had that uh, software since uh, 2013, 2012, so fiscal year 13, which is our first full year with it. Um, and this shelter has been responsible for the death of 20,000 cats in that time period. And we would wager that our complaints about cat overpopulation have not stopped. So if you consider the euthanasia of 20,000 cats, and we still haven't solved it, I think we have to think of something else. And a, a lot of the, the science and research uh, supports that that's really counterproductive. Um, the population rebounds even bigger, and um, the better effect, of course, is the trap-neuter return. So um, the population will stabilize if you're putting those spay-neutered cats back. It also stops the stress and nuisance. I think that's a lot of why it came before the council, was because, uh, one, it's kitten season, so there's lots more activity with cats right now, and so people are seeing it more than they are during other times of year. Uh, but two, it, it, I think the main complaint and the main description of nuisance is the mating behaviors, the yowling, the fighting, the spraying, and everything that goes with that. And really, spay-neutering cats and putting them back will mitigate a large amount of that. Um, so that's just... I would like to interject something yes, here as far as the vacuum effect goes. Um, you can also see the same vacuum effect when you have a uh, on a uh, more of a farm based uh, example um, if you have a large population of predators such as bobcats coyotes wolves um, if you go through and depopulate the area you will have the predators move back in and they will uh, well you may reduce the levels for a temporary time, maybe a couple months, half a year, um, they will rebound uh, because there's more opportunity in that area for resources. So um, this isn't just a uh, feral cat, community cat um, example. There's many more examples out there uh, from other um, unbiased sources if you like to, if anyone cares to research that. So just a little different perspective. Absolutely. Uh, as I mentioned, this cat ordinance was adopted in the infancy of No Kill San Angelo. Since then, we've invested heavily in cat programming. Contra Valley Paws has done a tremendous amount of work with spay neutering community cats, as have we through our shelter neuter program. Um, we've increased the live release for cats, and I have some numbers on that as well. But see, felines saved still lag behind the total animals saved. And there's a continued investment needed to make sure that we are um, appropriately caring for our cats. We really had to do a culture shift as part of No Kill, about, uh, as part of our Pets Alive programming, to change the way we think about cats in general. Um, so in 2015, when this ordinance was adopted, um, our live release rate for, the, uh, for all animals was 27%. Uh, but felines lagged far behind at only 9% of felines saved. Um, in 2020, um, we had an 82% live release rate, and we had 66% of our felines saved. So you can see we're saving more dogs than cats um, to get that average number up to 82%. And really in the last two years, comparing um, 18 to 19 and 19 to 20, we've doubled our feline save rate in two years. We went from low teens in 2018 uh, to about 30% in 2019, and now 66% in 2020. So certainly, it's a much safer community for cats um, than we have been in the past, um, but there's still that continued investment needed. Um, So uh, when the council mentioned that they have these colonies that are nuisances, and I do want to be careful that, you know, there are colonies of cats that are cared for by a, a caregiver um, who does have responsibilities as outlined under the ordinance. But there's also a tremendous number of, I call them naturally occurring um, community cats. They're not relying on a human food source. Um, they don't need a lot of intervention from people. And for those, you know, who's going to be responsible for spay neutering those cats? And uh, for those that are approaching the level of being deemed a nuisance, it's gonna be us for a minute. Um, the city council did consider um, 
did approve um, allocating five thousand uh, dollars for those colonies that are at a level that are a nuisance. So certainly I've gotten a call a ca calls from different council members that have colonies in their area that are uncontrolled, that are creating a nuisance for the neighborhood, and those will be first on our list to, um, to go and make contact with. Um, we were able to, after the council meeting and their support, um, meet with PAWS leadership about um, kind of a public-private partnership on, on these nuisance colonies where um, that $5,000 is flexible on, you know, perhaps I could pay staff overtime um, and PAWS can leverage some spay-neuter grant dollars specifically for colony cats um, and we can maybe have more bang for our buck uh, to be able to um, impact even more animals. Um, so we're in the infancy of developing this program. It's, it, I, I do want to be careful. It's a new program for us. We're, we're going to be, um, PAWS is going to be um, providing traps. We will be um, delivering the traps, retrieving them uh, when full uh, council approved for the fee waiver of, of all of those things to be done at no cost, specifically for these nuisance colonies. Um, we identified about a half dozen that we're going to try to make contact with and, and provide these services uh, for those cats to be spay-neutered, uh, rabies vaccinated, and um, HCPCH vaccinated. And so those cats will go back um, healthy and fixed and uh, to stabilize, stabilize that population. Is the $5,000, is that like a one-time thing to see how the program does and then revisit it? Okay. It is, yes, and that's a good question. Um, this was just some seed money to um, see what we could do. Uh, we wanted to be able to speak to the council's concern and provide some attention and um, the council uh, wants a lot of media attention, uh, which we've already been in contact with our communications director about how to share that and what our message needs to be. Um, and then to report back to the council our successes and those things that are still in need for improvement. Um, so I easily could have asked for, you know, triple this amount of money and spent it, um, but we wanted to get something started to speak to the issue and, um, but still, you know, humanely uh, provide services for these animals and for the community. Got it. So <clears throat> there are certain responsibilities of caregivers. How are we ensuring that they are doing what the ordinance states? The I mean, ordinance states the sponsoring organization ensures that they're complying. Right. So we have no um, enforcement capabilities. Um, so we don't, so if we encounter a cat population, we don't know if it's a registered colony or just a naturally occurring group of cats. We don't know if there's a caregiver. We don't know who's responsible. Um, can we just not ask to say, does anybody, I mean, can we not ask that organization that we cannot mention? Can we not ask them, is this colony registered to y'all? And if so, are they in compliance of the ordinance? I mean, I would think that we could at least ask questions, I would think. We could. The ordinance doesn't provide that they have to answer us. The ordinance provides that the citizen should be calling the sponsoring organization mm -hmm. and saying, I have a concern that this colony is not compliant um, and that the uh, city enforcement is, um, is not a um, cog in that wheel, so to speak. So that's real difficult for someone if they can't get the name of the organization to call the sponsoring organization if they've got an issue with a colony, I, I guess. I'm right, there's definitely room for improvement in the yeah. law. And even before the cease and desist, we did have conversations about, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of good things in this ordinance. How do we do it? Mm -hmm. How does this work on a daily basis? And so when, when I took this role in 2017, you know, I didn't have the cease and desist in place, but the ordinance still wasn't, real functional for scenarios like you're describing. Mm -hmm. We didn't get any kind of feedback. You know, the citizen calls us and complains, hey, this colony is non-compliant. We encourage them to contact the sponsoring organization and we would never hear back, hey, it's been resolved or we're working on it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the nuisance component of the um, ordinance does allow the caregiver 30 days to gain compliance, um, but we, we, don't, we just don't get any feedback of, um, whether um, that's happening or not. May I make just a uh, proposed uh, action that could be done that may potentially either a help make this uh, more accessible to the public, which is more the problem here that I'm kind of sensing, and also uh, more accessible for 
allowing the ordinance to function. Maybe we should reach out to the sponsoring organization and trying to get actual feedback conversations. If that organization is maybe not wanting to comply or not just wanting to be entangled with uh, a government organization, which is completely fine. Everybody has their own reasons, rules, past grievances. Um, completely understand that. Um, at that point, maybe looking for a more open community partner uh, may be a, also a solution in that problem. Um, because in all actuality, it's really looking for openness, communication, and uh, a two-way conversation. These are always the successes in uh, conflict resolution and in making a functional uh, partnership. Um, in all respect to the organization, that's really the, I think, what is wanted. Um, from the people that have to deal with it on a daily basis. So I think that may be our better approach is to see if we can start the conversation back up and if unable to, maybe look to see if there's someone else that's willing to do that. So, I mean, that's, unfortunately, I think that's probably been something that's been going on for several years now. And, um, you know, uh, I just feel that it's time to either have an open conversation, uh, try to make either amends from either direction and or written guarantees. And if unable to, you know, have that conversation or uh, if parties are unwilling to agree to certain stipulations that other people want, then maybe it's time to just move along and go a different route. And, you know, uh, in all seriousness, if we can't have an open conversation and have to talk in a third party uh, voice about a group that we can't mention name in a council meeting, which is kind of pointless because it's just kind of like saying, you know, well, I heard from this person and from this person, I feel that it's not clear to the public. So uh, I feel that we should be clear to the public. And if we're unable to be clear to the public, then we need to find organizations willing to be, let us be clear with them. It's, uh, I really have just sat here and heard the same stories several times for several years now. So uh, that's my suggestion, so. I think one thing that, um, that I've been careful for in my role is to, you know, serve the, the directives we've been given. And, and I just, I'm really proud that we have done that and are doing that. You know, we've invested in a lot of partnerships that are bearing fruit and we are, we're doing the thing. You know, last year our live release rate was the highest ever at 82%. This coming year, it, it, it's gonna be 90%. We are very on track to make that happen. And so while there are some parts, for example, of this ordinance that are clunky and room for improvement, in our daily operations, um, we're, we're thriving and succeeding and our animals are as well. Oh, most definitely so. And uh, I'm not, in that particular statement or uh, proposed, you know, try, try to do course of action to either reestablish communication uh, and open up to being that is simply with this one particular section. The rest of the uh, Austin Pets Alive, um, uh, Contra Valley Paws, uh, the, um, there's also a couple of wild health rehabilitator groups. Um, I don't really know if they want their names given out too much, so I'm not going to say that just because apparently that might be a little bit of a touchy subject for some people, so I'll just try to respect everyone's wishes on that. Um, you know, being able to have those conversations and say those names out loud makes it just a more free-flowing and able to give a people other ways to see what these come from. I just feel, you know, openness, being honest, secrecy is a horrible thing, especially on something that should be a community project. So, and I do commend uh, all the programs that y'all have uh, actually set up and run. Those have started to show fruit. And I just wish other people would actually also be more willing to help with that as well. Uh, because in all honesty, 
uh, they're more than just there's more than just one organization needed to truly accomplish this goal and more local support and gathered the better it would be so um, it seems like a lot of little chieftains and not a, enough just focusing on the greater good so uh, but I do uh, I do and I have seen the results from other projects and they've been very good I just on this particular one I feel like maybe it's time to either hammer it out or move along with a different prospect. Okay. We are still in the early stages of program design about how to spend this money, and so we'll certainly report back to you, um, as we will to the council as well. Anybody else have any questions? Do we need to make a motion to approve? Or? This one happened kind of backwards where the council approved it before y'all did, so it was mostly an, an update, and, and for that I, I apologize. It was just weird how the meetings fell. Um, so I don't think there's any net action needed. Okay. We'll move on to the last item, update on any of stray livestock practices. Yes, I'm sorry, can I borrow that part? I don't have a PowerPoint for this, but I did want to give you all an update. There was something I became aware of that we were non-compliant with, and I was <laughs> uncomfortable with that, as was our city attorney. So um, just to kind of um, clarify, I don't have a presentation on it, but um, just the memo I put in y'all's background that um, there's a state agriculture code that speaks to what should happen with estray livestock. So any hoofed animal that is outside of its enclosure, if it's in the city right-of-way, is considered estray. Uh, there are certain requirements set forward in that state statute that you have to do. Um, for example, you have to um, keep a, a, a log of all known livestock owners in your area and their brands and tags. Um, you are to post a notice with the county clerk that you have found estray livestock. Uh, run an ad in the paper, uh, send certified mail. Um, it's really like creating a case anytime you have estray livestock. Uh, the big thing you're trying to avoid here is any kind of accusations of horse, horse thievery. Um, and so uh, that has that was something we were not um, trained in or have the resources to do. Um, the stat statute also mandates that the organization to provide that service is um, the sheriff's department. So your, your county um, officials. And so uh, we did meet with the sheriff and let him know that uh, we're responding to a tremendous number of estray livestock calls um, in the area. We take in a large number of what I would call livestock, but estray doesn't speak to fowl. So any of our chicken intake are, is not subject to this. So we, when we have chickens loose in the street, that's not part of this discussion. Also, any kind of seizure warrants or owner surrenders of livestock, that's not part of this either. And so there's um, 30 to 60 animals a year that we take in as part of estray. Um, there are a number of other cases we work where we respond to estray livestock, pretty quickly get connected with the property owner, and we don't actually impound. Um, and so we would, uh, we had a conversation with the sheriff to say, um, there are these requirements. We are non-compliant and uncomfortable with that. Um, so there are a couple of options. Um, the county already provides the service outside city limits as they're required to do so. So do they want to take it on for city limits as well and provide that service? So now when people would call and say, hey, there's a horse loose, uh, we would say, great, call the county and, and they will respond. Um, there's also a provision in the statute that the sheriff can assign um, an organization or an individual to uh, provide that service. So he can contract with us to be that, um, but we would ask for the appropriate staff and training and resources to appropriately house livestock. Uh, we actually have a case, well, we are not really built to hold any amount of livestock. If I have a couple goats, I can accommodate that pretty easily. Um, anything mm. more than that, we're, we're really stressed on staff time as well as our um, pens. I, 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 
I don't even a couple want to call of cows it a out there aren't it's, too bad, but if you get more in probably about three or four cows or probably about five or ten goats, you're starting to push that place real hard. It's difficult. They're expensive to keep. It's not a food I keep on uh, the premises. It's a big drag on staff time, especially now while we're full um, during our summer months. Um, actually, during the the freeze and the big storm in February, we had four cow on the cows on the premises. And um, we actually had to send them to foster because we couldn't provide appropriate care because I had no water and I couldn't keep their um, troughs from freezing over. And so um, it, it's something that is a drain on staff time. And so we are in those discussions. Um, so every day we pick up livestock, I'm, I'm uncomfortable. And, and our process is that we hold that animal for 14 days. Uh, we run it on the city's Facebook page. Uh, we do ask for some kind of proof of ownership when someone claims them. Um, and... Uh, hope for the best, but it, it isn't uh, to the letter of the law compliant, and so it is something we're wanting action on uh, pretty quickly. Um, and so we're hoping that the sheriff has the opportunity during their budget discussions, which we're all going through right now, to discuss, you know, are they going to take that on? Are they going to contract with us? What would be the financial impact of any of that? Um, but it is something I wanted y'all to be aware of that we're working on um, and that we want to uh, improve on. I may be wrong in this department, but is it only 14 days or is it 30? The city ordinance says 14 days, but the city ordinance is not compliant with the state statute. Okay, because that's what, when we were, when we went through school, we uh, got some uh, uh, laws and basic, you know, you know, if the guy comes up with a cow that he found on the side of the road, what do you do? And uh, I, we were taught 30 days. So yeah, I think it's pretty... The and sheriff indicated 15 days. So it's in the statute in y'all's background. I can't lay my hands on it right now this second. But the sheriff indicated 15 days, which is we hold it for 14 days and put it up for adoption on the 15th day. So I think he and I are on the same... Um, hmm. Um, Maybe it's just if you're a private citizen, if you found a livestock, you have to give 30 days. Yeah, or before. if there's been any legislative changes. Yeah, so um, that may be that may be where that was. So I was just kind of yeah a little vague. I haven't actually gone through and read that law in a while, so just curious. So nothing for y'all's action today. Just something to be aware of that we um, that we are aware of it and we are working on it. And we're confident we'll find some some kind of solution to bring us compliant. Okay. Anybody have any questions with regard to that? All right. Well, uh, follow up and administrative issues. You have anything, Morgan? Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, then that brings us to an adjournment. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion. So moved. I second. And second. Out of here. Thank y'all.